this is the fourth in our series about editing in comic books professionally. Um, hopefully you've watched the previous three videos, but even if you haven't, I'm going to be able to jump in midstream and you'll probably get the gist of what I'm going to talk about today. So let's get started. Uh, the editor's principal responsibility uh, when it comes to editing a title for a company like Marvel and DC is really in assembling the creative team that will do the actual work of making the stories and making the, the comics. I believe, and I do not exaggerate this uh, one iota, that the act of hiring the right creators for a particular project is 90% of the job. Which is to say, if you hire the right people, the rest of it is gravy. They will produce excellent work almost without you having to do anything. They will do it in a timely fashion. They will be as conscious, if not more conscious, of the deadlines and the need to produce uh, as you are, and everything will go easily. The flip side of that, unfortunately, is if you hire the wrong people, there's only going to be so much you can do to salvage a situation. Whether that's people that just don't have uh, the right handhold on who and what the characters are, whether it's, it's creators that are less experienced or who are in such demand that their attention is pulled six different ways and they cannot focus on the thing that they're doing for you. I really do believe that 90% of the gig and 90% of what will separate uh, a great editor from just a ho-hum editor is the ability to find the right people for a given assignment. Unfortunately, the process of doing that is almost entirely a gut level instinct. It's not something that is easily taught because the needs of every series are different. And those needs change over time. If you're inheriting a particular title or a particular character, it probably benefits you as an editor to look at what has come immediately before. Who did it in the months or years leading up to your point? How was it received? What aspects of the property were explored in depth and, and handled really well? What aspects of the property haven't maybe been explored uh, to the same degree during that time? What angles are there on the underlying concept that haven't been explored yet or, or haven't been played with to, to your satisfaction? And what stuff is well-trod territory that we don't need to repeat? And then within that, who within your sense of what creators are out there in the world might be able to bring a viewpoint to what you're doing that would accentuate those parts of the job that you feel should be accentuated. It is uh, a necessary part of an editor's gig to kind of have a sense of who is out there in the world producing comics, trying to, to, to get onto bigger assignments, making some waves and producing work that, uh, that resonates with you so that you have the widest possible potential Rolodex to call upon when it's time to cast an issue of Spider-Man or the Hulk. At Marvel, uh, there is a saying, uh, and it's a saying that I developed, so uh, make of that what you will. Maybe it's only a so-so saying, but it does communicate a certain point of view, and that is this. The creators make the characters, but the characters make the creators. And by that I mean getting the opportunity to write Amazing Spider-Man is effectively like a, a, a race driver being put behind the wheel of a Maserati. Spider-Man is a almost 60-year-old character, a top-flight character in the industry. A lot of people like Spider-Man. A lot of people follow the adventures of Spider-Man month in and month out, almost regardless of who is working on it. So the same talent working on an issue of Spider-Man is likely to garner a much bigger audience then they will just working on the next issue of some new made-up thing that has no track record. It's a well-functioning machine, and you get to drive it. By the same token, the creators who drive it, they're the ones who maintain the, the strength and the power of Amazing Spider-Man, who get the most out of it every month, that keep it fresh and, and lively, and keep it a top-selling character and title, over time, even as it passes from creator to creator, by finding new things to, to do, by finding ways to leverage the long publishing history that the character has had, 
by telling stories that have never been told before uh, with Spider-Man, by uh, finding ways to resonate with the key moments in Spider-Man's history in a way that really fulfills the, uh, the tenure of the readers who have stuck with the book for so long and so forth. A creator who goes and works on a major title, whether that's Batman at DC or whether that's Buffy at Dark Horse, or whether it's X-Men at Marvel, or whatever, is probably going to walk away with a bit more notoriety within the field than when they first showed up. And that notoriety is going to make it much more easy to uh, attract an audience to their own work, be it creator-owned or be it on another character subsequent to that. So it is a, a symbiotic relationship. One is not more important than the other. Both of them have their strengths, and combining those aspects and those elements into a unified whole gets the best out of both of them. Uh, every editor develops a signature editorial style, kind of whether they want to or not. Whatever books you put out are reflective of your editorial point of, of view and they contribute to that signature. Um, typically at most of the major companies uh, an editor will have some breakout project, some project that, that hits and really does well and, and kind of makes them set apart from the pack and inevitably they become characterized as the editor of that and that can be a limiting thing as well as it is uh, a liberating thing in that you've got some success under your belt and uh, you can leverage that in terms of getting your next projects approved through whatever editorial system you have and up and, and running. But you can also be seen as the person who only does this thing. So if supernatural westerns are not the only kind of comic you want to edit, sometimes it can be difficult to overcome the pull of but you, you do those great supernatural westerns that everybody loves and that sells so great. I wouldn't necessarily put you on a romance book because, you know, you do supernatural westerns. It is a double-edged sword, or it can be, but everything that you do, hopefully, goes into your overall uh, reputation. The editor at a company like a Marvel has three additional larger goals beyond putting out excellent comics uh, every month, at, you know, selling a lot of those comics, reaching a, a mass audience, and bringing a lot of both money and reflected glory into the organization. Those three larger goals are these. Number one is creating equity, which is to say making an additive contribution to Marvel with every story. In, in, a, in a larger company like Marvel or DC, anything that you may work on potentially has the has the the likelihood to end up as a, a piece of a television show or a film or a licensed product a statue or an action figure or or a whatever so paying attention to the fact that that is a thing that that happens and finding those instances where it can be done materially without you know bending or or breaking the structure of your story is is valuable and enhances your value as an editor to the company. Number two is thinking about the bigger picture or thinking globally, which is to say how is what you're doing creating value throughout all of those other lines of business. It kind of is, there's an overlap with, with uh, part one. I think the difference there is that in creating equity, you're also looking at creating equity within a publishing line. There could be things that spin off. There could be other ancillary titles that could grow the footprint of a particular property within the marketplace. Whereas if you're thinking, talking about thinking globally, you're really talking about uh, you know, other lines of business within a given organization. Number three is about planning the future, which is to say creating the stories today that lead to the stories tomorrow. Whether those are stories that, you know, grow and blossom within the universe of whatever property you're dealing with, uh, or whether those are stories that exist beyond your publishing endeavors into other media beyond the immediate thing that, that you're doing. So as an editor, uh, it's always worthwhile to keep these other ancillary goals in mind while you're developing the stories that you're working on in a month-by-month -month way. 
for every project that you work on, uh, at the outset, you should ask yourself a couple of questions. Number one is, what is the point of this project? What is it that you're trying to achieve, you and the creators you're working with? What are you trying to say? What are you trying to communicate? Who are you trying to reach? Uh, what goal are you trying to achieve? Also, what patch of ground does the project that you are putting together stand on that no other book in within your own publishing company and in a best case scenario no other book within the industry uh, stands on? What is the unique perspective of what you're doing? What is it that makes this valuable and worthwhile and not just another in an endless series of uh, superhero titles where a guy fights another guy because he's good and they're bad. What is it that you're trying to communicate? How is what you're doing unique? When it comes to putting together a project, at, again, at least at a Marvel or a DC, uh, we tend to think of it uh, as the three C's. The, the equation that, that creates a project is character plus creator plus concept. And by concept, I mean the specifics of the story that is being done. So your character could be Spider-Man, your creator could be Ed Brubaker writing Spider-Man with Steve McNiven drawing it, and your concept is it's a story where the burglar that killed Uncle Ben comes back and he's on a vendetta and Spidey has to do a cool thing to stop him. You kind of need all three of those areas to be functioning at at least a solid level to have a decent chance of success. And if one is weaker than others, certainly it's easier to sell a Spider-Man story than it is to sell a Jack of Hearts story. So if you are doing or trying to put together a Jack of Hearts story for some reason, you feel that there's untapped potential in that character, or some creator has shown up with a really good insight in Jack of Hearts, you need to make sure that the other two bases uh, feel especially strongly covered, that you've got the right talent and they're excellent, um, or that the, the story idea itself is so compelling that even people who don't care about Jack of Hearts or know who he is will be drawn and driven to check out what you're doing. An adjunct to all of that is the question of why this project now? Comics are not made in a vacuum. Uh, they are part of the cultural zeitgeist. Uh, and that means that sometimes there are projects that, that uh, are of their era and that will not function in the same way if you put them out even just a few years earlier or later. Why are you doing the project that you're trying to do now? Why is it relevant in the, at this moment? What does it have to say to the audience? What does it speak to in the common experiences of humankind in this particular moment? The better you can define these things going in and at the outset, the better chance you'll have of being able to realize them in the finished book. There's more to come in the weeks ahead, so hopefully you'll be back here again. Feel free to leave me comments in the comments section of any questions you might have about any of this stuff. I swear we're getting to actual physical hands-on editing eventually. <laughs>